sorry I'm late. Oh, can you, can you hear me? I'm short, so. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I'll tell you, I think the theme for today is confession. So I'll start with just a story, a small story. Two weeks ago, I was at a conference uh, in Georgia, and uh, it was for medical residency program directors. So I, I'm one of the associate program directors for the internal medicine and pediatrics program. And so this was for pediatric residency program directors and what we call med peds program directors. So mostly pediatricians and some internists like myself as well. And um, there was a bunch of different learning sessions. And one of the learning sessions that I attended, I saw it on the list of possible sessions I could go to, and it was called I Object, Conscientious Objection to Gender Affirming Care in Residency Training um, and Balancing Vulnerabilities. So I thought, oh, this is a good idea. I can go and see how like people deal with this, you know, how to deal with, uh, you know, conscientious objectors and what if you are a conscientious objector? And I was thinking, you know, like that's mostly what this will be is a bunch of people that are like probably conscientious objectors, but it was the opposite. It was mostly people that are not conscientious objectors and they want to know how do you deal with it? How do you deal with these people that are objecting? That's really what it was. And um, they gave us like a training scenario a little make-believe session that we all should act out in our little small groups inside of the session. And the make-believe session was, there is a resident who is objecting to providing gender-affirming care. And you're the attending and you have to talk to this resident who's objecting. And then there's a program director who has to deal with the whole situation afterwards. And so they're passing out the roles and afterwards, you know, all the groups are discussing in public. And of course, most of the people that are standing up are like, this is a really hard scenario because like, you know, I don't want to be that acting person. I don't want to be that, that medical resident. Like that's just, it's just a crazy scenario. And I don't want to identify with them at all. Like this is nonsense. It's ridiculous what they're thinking. And like, it's very difficult for me to like pretend that I'm objecting to this, which of course is like a very biased opinion. And that's how it was going for a good 10 minutes. At one point, one person stood up and said, this is ridiculous that we've been having this session. Like, I, I can't believe that we're even giving a possibility for somebody to object to this. This is crazy. Very vocal. Until finally, there was one person that stood up and said, you know, it came to this small group's turn. And it was a little tiny doctor. She's a fellow. She hadn't even finished her training yet. And she said, this scenario hits very, very close to home for me. Because as a Christian, I felt this way during residency that I was not able to voice my objection, objection without feeling threatened, without feeling guilty. And when I rotated through this clinic, this gender health clinic, I felt like I couldn't do anything except for keep silent and just agree with what was going on. And so, you know, I'm glad that we're having the session so that we could discuss. And so that way, like, you know, people that have faiths should not be ashamed to express their faith in public. And it changed the whole tone of the room. It was amazing. You know, afterwards, people were like, you know, I'm very glad that she said that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it just sort of, you know, it went on. There was still some back and forth, but there was at least a, a place to sort of have a discussion. And so, you know, I think this is very similar actually to today, to the what the Holy Church does today in the beginning of Holy Week, and it prepares us for the rest of Holy Week. And actually, that's what our Lord Christ did as well in the very beginning of Holy Week. And so the, the objective of today's talk is to confess Christ. If you went away with nothing, it's just confess Christ. It's simple. It's not complicated, but it is hard. It's not easy. So it's simple, but it's hard to accomplish. Why do we have this objective? It's for your sake, for the sake of people around you, for the sake of the whole world. And the reason I, I use that terminology is because from the very beginning, Christ always had a focus on the end. And from the, the beginning of this week, he had a focus on the end. And from the beginning of his ministry, the same thing. And from the beginning 
of his time on earth, it was the same thing. He was always focused on the end from the very start of Holy Week. So it's fitting, I think, that we think a little bit about the end right here at the front. So actually, if you think about it even, I know we're going to go back a little bit further. If you think even just about Christ's incarnation, you know, the house that he was born in, what was, what was the trade that, you know, in, in Jewish culture, even until now, in the Talmud, it says that you should always teach your children the Torah and a trade. What do you think the trade was that our Lord Christ was apprenticed under? I don't know if I heard the answer. Yeah, carpenter. Why? Because Joseph was a carpenter. Why did he choose that trade? Yeah, the cross. So he could know the cross from the very beginning. Even from that moment, he chose the cross. He knew everything about the wood that was chosen for the cross. He knew how his blood would stain the wood. He knew how heavy it would be. He knew everything about the cross. He always was focused on the crucifixion, on the end, and the resurrection, on us. And actually, if you look back to think about what were the last words that Jesus Christ spoke when he was on earth. Anybody remember? It is finished? No. Forgive them for they know not what they do? No. What? Yes. You said it. Acts. So it's not in the Gospels. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. This is actually his last words here. And so when I say our objective today, what we're learning today, the lesson of Pascha on, on Sunday, the eve of Monday, is confess Christ. And that was actually the last command or the last statement that he made. You'll be witnesses, the whole world, everywhere. And that's where the church starts. Today we start with what? It was Palm Sunday. It was Palm Sunday. I know when we think of first, well, let's, let's go back, confession. We always think of confession first as the sacrament. Am I right? Whenever you hear the word confession, you think of the sacrament of confession and repentance. And that's, that's good that you think this way. Because immediately after Christ entered into the temple, into, entered into Jerusalem, where did he go? Into the temple. And so it's good that you think of confession this way too. And even the church does the same thing. And, and in the gospel, it's the same thing. Christ entered into Jerusalem, and then he entered into the temple to clean out the temple. That's what confession is. When he entered into Jerusalem, what did we say? Hosanna. What does Hosanna mean? Save us. Save us, and what else? Save us now. Hosanna means save us now. If you look at the Hebrew, Hosanna, save us now. And it comes, if you read in the Psalm 118, it'll be save us now. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes, name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. So Hosanna is save us now. That's this first confession. We enter into Palm Sunday. We enter into Jerusalem. Hosanna, save us now. And, and that phrase, save us now, each word has meaning. Save us and now. And even you can relate it to that final statement where he says, you will be witnesses to me in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the world. Save us now is almost that mirrored. It's the same verse mirrored. And, you know, I learned from uh, Mark Gerges, who I think is not here. I think he's speaking at CTR today from your church, right? He taught us that during Holy Week, it's a good idea to sort of have a, a verse or a phrase that you like, that you repeat and meditate on the whole of Holy Week. And for me, I think this is a great one for this Holy Week is Hosanna, just meditating on Hosanna, save us now. So we enter into Jerusalem. And what is Jerusalem symbolically? We are Jerusalem. Of course, we already know that. And Christ entered in Jerusalem and he went directly into the temple. 
into the heart, and then he overturned all the tables. And that's exactly what confession really is. You want to go inside of your heart, and you want to clean out all the sins immediately. And that's how we start Holy Week. Definitely, it's internal struggle, this internal confession. But I also want us to focus on one word of Hosanna. It's the now portion. Because this confession is actually only able to happen in the present moment, currently. Save us now. The now is very, very important. There's a very nice exercise from C.S. Lewis. I think it's in the screw tape letters. Where he says, think about your day. What percentage of your day do you think about the past? So you think about, you know, worrying about, you know, what I did wrong. I wish I could have done this differently, etc. Okay. What percentage of your day do you think about the future? What you're worried about, what am I going to do here, the hypotheticals, the what-ifs, all the, the finances, the family, all that stuff that you're worried about. The reality is the past doesn't exist. It's a figment of your memory. The future doesn't exist, hasn't happened. We don't know how it will happen. The only thing that actually exists is the present moment. The only time that you have to interact with God is in the present. The only time that you interact with everybody else in your relationships is in the present moment. He says, the present is the point at which time touches eternity. Of the present moment and of it only, humans have an experience analogous to the experience which God has of reality as a whole. It is alone the freedom and actuality that are offered to them. This is the only time you have. It touches eternity right now, the present moment. And that's the essence of what confession is. When you're there with Abuna, but also when you're outside, when you're by yourself, when you're in your day-to-day -day life, all of that is a time for confession and repentance. It's a continuous, always process of confessing. It's an eternal process. The present is the only time that exists, and you will exist in the present moment for all eternity. Does that make sense? For all eternity, the only time in which you exist is in the present moment. So that is when we should be repenting and confessing. It's always, it's a life of repentance. It's a life of confession. That's why, you know, St. Paul says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Every moment is a chance for prayer. Give thanks in all circumstances. You'll find that, you know, praying, repenting, and thanksgiving are all sort of united. So in the ninth hour, from the day of Sunday, today, the ninth hour, Christ entered into the temple. From the eleventh hour, he says this. He says in the gospel, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be great, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first, let him be your slave. So in the ninth hour, we enter into the heart. And in the 11th hour, he tells us, you should be humble. You should be their servant. You should be their slave. If you want to be great, if you want to be first, you should be their servant and their slave. So first we emphasize the now, the present, and now we emphasize the humility. You should always be subservient. And to who? Obviously, we're all subservient to God. The only way to have humility is to know that there's somebody greater than you, that there is perfection. This is the essence of like all spiritual warfare, is that God is great and we are, we're in need, we're low. So for all eternity, the best way to have this sort of humility is to be with God, be in relation to God. St. Augustine said, to understand you have to believe. Basically, you can't know yourself until you really know God. It's connected. You can't really know yourself unless you realize the greatness of God. Then you'll know your true like nature, who you really are. If you worship the creator, he must increase, but I must. If you just even read what's that St. John the Baptist, right? If you just read from John chapter three, his little speech, it's a great testament to how it means to, to confess humility, to be humble. He must increase and I must decrease. A man receives nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. 
That's part of his speech. We get nothing unless we get it from God. So again, you see that pathway of confession that starts from the gospel, the you know, Pesca of Sunday, the day of Sunday. Save us now. So it emphasizes the Creator. He's the one who saves us. He's the one, he's the one that gives us everything. Us, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the world, now, in the present moment. Save us now, Hosanna. But also, now if we move into the, the eve of Monday, the first hour, confession is not just this movement of the heart. There's also something physical that we need to be doing. So when you read the gospel of the first hour, John chapter 12, he says, He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Again, and where I am, there my servant will be. And this is, yes, spiritual, but it's also physical. You have to be around him and his church and the one he loves. You have to be there physically. You know, we tell residents half of the job is just being present. It's not all the knowledge and everything else. It's just being present. That's half of the job. Just being there. Today I was joking with, with my wife, Maria. We have a, a three-month-old, almost four-month-old. Her name is Sophia. And Sophia is with my wife, you can imagine. She's nursing like 24-7, right? That's how it is with a nursing child. They have to feed every two to three hours. So there's no way around that. You have to nurse them every two to three hours. But besides that, she's literally like with her, next to her, basically touching her almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the last like almost four months. And I was joking with her that like she's making a little mini Maria because she's there witnessing everything that she's doing all the time. You know, she's going and playing with the other two kids. She's holding Sophia in one hand, and she's like cooking and, and playing and doing all this other stuff with the other hand. She's with her all the time. She's making a little mini-me. And that's what it, that's part of this, is physically being present. There is the physicality, the flesh that's involved with being a follower of Christ. You have to be there. You have to be present. You have to be at church. You have to be in confession. Physically, you have to talk. You have to take communion. You're baptized, you have the, the sacraments, the sort of physical manifestation of the spiritual mysteries. You have to be physically there. So it's a commitment of your time, of your place, of who you are. You have to be present. Once I, um, I was uh, in, on a mission trip with the church a long time ago, and there was Abuna Lazarus. He's this uh, New Zealand Coptic monk. And we were in Tanzania, and there was a small chapel inside of the mission church, or the mission area that we were at. And he got upset with all the youth that were on the trip. He said, like in a British, you know, Australian accent, how come none of you guys are in the church? And we're like, what are you talking about? Abuna, all we're doing is like, all day long, all it is is like service all day long. Yeah, but none of you is sitting inside the church. How come I don't find you just sitting in there reading and praying and meditating. This is holy. You should take your shoes off and you should be there all the time. Whenever you have a chance, you should just sit in the church. Just be there. Um, you know, a long time ago, uh, our cousin George, uh, you know, Linda's brother, when he was like 19 or 20, the summer before he passed away, he went to Egypt on a mission trip. Similar mission trip. They were going to go to Upper Egypt and do service and all this stuff. And he decided he was going to go early before the trip started by a few days. And he asked somebody to drop him off at the monastery, Dear Sir Yan. And then when he was there, he said, is it possible if I just stay here the whole month instead of going on the mission trip? I know they're going to do service, they're going to go to Upper Egypt, whatever, but I just want to stay here in the monastery. From the first moment he got there, he went directly inside of the church and he sat there for like an hour or two hours until finally they were like, you know, what should we do with this guy, basically? And then he got permission to stay there the whole time. His friends were on the trip. His friends were going to be, on, you know, they're all going to do great stuff for the whole time. But all he wanted to do was sit inside of the church. He wanted to sit in the monastery for the whole month. 
This is you being like it says, like our Lord said in the Gospel of John. Where I am, there my servant will be also. And you notice that during this last Holy Week, our Lord Christ is really staying kind of in the same place. He's around Jerusalem and in Bethany. And he's, he's finding refuge there. He's giving his last words there. And the whole eve of Monday is all about prepping his disciples. Every gospel is now, I'm going to be suffering. I will be crucified. But don't worry, I'll rise on the third day. The whole time. Over and over and over again, he's getting this message. And that's what we do. We know the message. It's been told to us, but we come over and over and over again because it's good for us to prepare us, to ready for us, to ready us for, for the future. And you know, Bethany, what does the word Bethany mean? Yes, there's a good students over here somewhere. House of suffering or house of figs. House of suffering or house of figs. Some people think, you know, why suffering? Because they think maybe Bethany, which is a couple of miles away from like Jerusalem and the temple, was a place where they like sort of had like sick people generally. So it was a place of suffering. And that's another lesson for confession. It should be uncomfortable. And when Christ prepared his disciples, he prepared them saying, you know, this is actually in the sixth hour gospel of today. The Son of Man will be betrayed, and they will condemn him to death, and they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. Confession is not supposed to be comfortable. It's supposed to be difficult. The other thing is, confession is kind of open. If you are with him all the time, everybody's sort of aware of your confession. Does that make sense? For example, you hang out with this group of kids, they're all skaters all the time. You start, people start to think you're a skater or whatever, you know, groups they have at school these days. They used to call them like skaters when I was growing up. Like you're with the group of skaters. That was who you are. And if you are with Christ all the time, you get associated with him. That happened even with Christ. Remember when he was hanging out with the tax collectors and the sinners? They said, why does your master hang around with tax collectors and sinners? Right? They accused him of that. Because you sort of are who you hang out with. And if you're open about your confession, if you're open about your association with the church, people will know. What are you doing on Friday night? What are you doing on Saturday night? And on Sunday morning? Why are you waking up? Why are you at, why, why you smell different every Wednesday morning when you come to work? It's all the before. What's this bread that you're eating all the time? Like the, people start to associate you with like the church and holy things. People bring Arbana to work after, you know, on Wednesdays and Fridays. If you start to deny your friends, it's a big problem. If you just start to deny these associations, it's a problem. And it happens, of course, to even the best of us, obviously, right? Like St. Peter and the next to the charcoal fire. Remember when he denied him three times, and he was next to what? You guys know about this? The, there's two places in the New Testament where they mention a charcoal made of fire. The first time is in John chapter 18, verse 18, when he was in the courtyard, when Jesus was being tried inside, and it was next to the fire made out of charcoal that he denied him three times. Do you want to guess where the next time you see in the gospel there's a charcoal made of fire? I think you said it. The end of the Gospel of St. John, chapter 21, verse 9, where he talks about how, you know, when they caught fish and Christ was there after the resurrection, there's only two times. And I'm sure that it was done this way so that Peter could remember, I denied him. I was with him all the time, but I didn't follow him all the way to the cross. I denied him and I left. And Christ gave him that opportunity of redemption at the end. And so you don't want to deny this association. It's part of who you are. It's part of your persona. You know, oftentimes people say you can know a man by his friends, right? That's sort of the Judea part of this. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the world. You know a man by his friends. There's also a saying, you know a man by his enemies. That's like the Samaria part of it. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the world. Okay, and I'll tell you the other thing about this is that Christ demands your confession. And we know this because 
actually, he asked the disciples multiple times. And in today's readings, in two of the gospel, two of the hours of today, he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Right? In the third hour and the ninth hour. The third hour, who do you say that I am? At first he says, like, what do the crowds say that I am? Who do the crowds say that I am? And then he says, but who do you say that I am? And who answered? Peter, you are the Christ. And again, in the ninth hour, the same thing. Who do men say that I am? And who do you say that I am? He wants to hear it. He's demanding your actual confession. Confession is not just confession and repentance. Confession also means your profession of faith. You are the Christ. He wants you to actually confess his name. And the people want to silence you, right? When he entered in Jerusalem, they said, stop them from screaming out this Hosanna stuff. And what did he say? Even if, if these were silent, even the stones, even the stones will speak out. The stones. You know, there's also another aspect of this open sort of profession. When you think about, you know, in the old church, sometimes you hear that there used to be public confession. Like instead of saying, Abuna, forgive me, I have sinned, intercede on my behalf, you know, I cursed. You actually would be in front of the whole church and tell the whole church all of your sins, or at least the public sins. If you've ever been discovered for your addiction, for your sin, this is a big deal, actually confessing publicly. It makes a huge difference to your spiritual life when all of your sins are laid bare in front of you and everybody has access to how terrible of a person I am. Makes a huge difference. Then your repentance, your change is so much different. Really, truly, when people are addicted to something, it makes a huge difference when they share that with their friends and their family. Help me get over this. For example, I had a patient a, a few weeks ago, 21 years old. And her boyfriend brought her to the emergency room where, luckily for her, in the emergency room, she stopped breathing from a fentanyl overdose. Her boyfriend noticed she wasn't breathing easily. He picked her up, took her to the emergency room. In the emergency room, she stopped breathing, and they did CPR, and they saved her life in the emergency room. Very lucky. And I said, I asked her, do you have Narcan? You know, that medication that you use that reverses fentanyl and opioid overdose. You give them a dose, and so it reverses the effects really quickly. It can save your life. So I said, do you have Narcan? Yes, I have it. Well, where is it? It's in my backpack at home. Well, where do you usually do drugs? In my room alone when my mom's not home. Does your mom know about your addiction? No, of course not. Well, then what good does it do to have Narcan when she doesn't know that you have it and you don't, she doesn't know that you're doing this and she can't save you? So, but if you want to make a change, you confess that sin. I have a problem. I'm an alcoholic and I need help. It makes such a big difference to have that accountability. That's that public sort of confession. Not just the profession of faith, but for our own sakes, the confession, the public profession makes a huge difference. Yes, it improves the world around you when you're confessing your faith, but it also improves you, first of all. And actually, more truly, when you are confessing publicly, it helps you the best. You are the most affected by your own confession. It's you. You're the one who gets the blessings when you confess publicly. I was uh, asking my dad some advice about, you know, Pascal Week and, and talking. And he said, Abuna Bushoi Camel, about confession, he said two things that I remember. So this is my dad remembering two things that Abuna Bushoi Camel said. He said, number one, confession is like vomit. I said, what do you mean? He said, you get it all out there. You get everything out. And remember, you feel better when you're sick and you vomit everything, all the bad stuff out, you feel better. And he said, the second thing is, you only confess your sins, not somebody else's sins. Because, you know, usually you go to confession, you're like, my wife made me do this, my wife made me do that. But it's better when you confess your sins. And so, obviously, this confession, this profession, it helps you more. And the public profession is sort of the final result of your inward confession. 
It's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. The confession emboldens you. Okay, so here's an example of the benefit of confession. In Matthew chapter 16, when, again, the same thing, who do you say that I am? And St. Peter responded, and he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And our Lord said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, right? We all, we all remember this. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. It's the foundation of the sacrament of confession and repentance. And when did he get this command? After he professed his faith. It's the same confession. We're given the command for confession right after Peter says, I proclaim. I confess my faith. You are the son of the living God. You are Christ, the son of the living God. That's when we get this blessing. All these blessings. You're going to be a new name. No more Simon Barjona. You're Peter. And on this rock, I'm going to build the church. And you have the kingdom of heaven. And Hades can't prevail against you. All these blessings that happen when you make this public confession. It's huge. So confession is also then being a witness. And we are the church. The Coptic church is the church of witnesses. What's the Greek word for witness? Right? We're the church of the martyrs. Witness, martyr. We are the church of witnesses. We are the church of confessors. And even until now, we sometimes use the word confessor for those who were tortured for their faith, but maybe not actually killed for their faith. Their faith. We are confessors. There's uh, In the book of Acts, there's a verse that says, those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. They turn the world upside down with their confession, with their profession. Is that what we do with our confession? Is the world sort of upside down now? And we have to, maybe the world is already upside down and now we have to turn it right side up. And those who have turned the world upside down, they have come here too. Is it the case that like people know, oh, the Christian is coming now. I know who they are. They're open. They're public. I know who they are. They have a decree. There is another king, Jesus. Just like in the hymn, Hosanna in the highest. This is the king of Israel. Okay. And remember, Elijah was saying that, I tell you that these should keep, if these should keep silent, the stones will cry out. Right? That's what the verse is. If we don't make this profession, the stones will cry out. And we know the chief cornerstone is our Lord Christ. And the believers will be the ones we should be crying out. We should be professing our faith. And we know that the end result is the martyrdom. That's okay. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Okay, yeah. Remember the story that I told you in the very beginning, that little pediatric fellow who spoke out and said, this affected me, I was a Christian. And I was afraid to speak out. And when she said that, everybody found a place to sort of say, yes, there's room for like a different opinion. There's room for like standing up for your faith. And when you actually make that profession of faith, it gives place for other people to follow in your footsteps. When one person sort of starts the revolution, other people follow afterwards. And in Song of Solomon, it says, follow after the footsteps of the flock. This is what it means. When you have somebody that you can follow after, you follow after the footsteps of the flock. Okay. Okay. Then we go now, we're almost done, the 11th hour of today. In the 11th hour of today, the disciples had a problem. They couldn't cast out a demon. And they went to our Lord with this problem. And God, our Lord God said, this kind cannot come out except by prayer and fasting. So here we have the whole day, our Lord is telling us, I'm going to be crucified. It's going to happen. Confess this faith. 
but it's not easy. It takes prayer and it takes fasting. But when you have this faith, even just like a mustard seed, then you will move mountains. And so he sort of concludes, the church concludes today on that note, that it's going to be hard. It's difficult. So, you know, that's, that's it basically. We have to confess. It's the confession of the heart. We start this day off in, in Palm Sunday and you go into the temple and you take out all the bad stuff and you do it now and now is continuous. It's always. And then we confess him openly. We confess him boldly, outwardly. We confess him publicly. And then we witness to him with faith, with faith, excuse me, prayer and fasting. That was it. Any questions? Other commentaries? Really?